like the way you die, boy. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest installment of Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and we have one this evening that a lot of you have been asking for, and that is Quentin Tarantino's 2012 spaghetti western mashup amalgamation of so many things, Django Unchained. Uh, this one has been perhaps a long time coming. As I said, a lot of you have been asking about it. And I'm really excited to be looking at this one because just a few weeks ago, my students and I in my cinema class, we analyzed this film for ourselves. And after students were empowered with some historical and cinematic background behind this film, they had really difficult time trying to interpret it. Like, what exactly does this movie mean? What are we to make of it as a historical and cultural product? Well, on this episode, we're going to be getting into some of those very discussions that I had with my students. And I think it's going to be a hell of a ride as we dive into it. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start. Django Unchained. So one of the first things that I was struck by when I saw this film many years ago in theaters was the fact that it says that it starts in 1858, but it's two years before the Civil War. Uh, and so that math doesn't quite work out. I guess it depends what is Quentin Tarantino's interpretation of when the Civil War begins. Uh, does he think of the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 as when the Civil War begins? Or is his math off? Or is he just being ironic as he does best? Um, but, you know, most people say that the American Civil War formally begins in 1861, although, of course, it was a long time in the making, as this film would suggest. Might that be you? Who wants to know? Well, I do. I'm Dr. King Schultz. This is my horse, Fritz. You have to love the character of Dr. King Schultz, um, who I always think of as this uh, Germanized version of Doc Holliday. Uh, both of these men, you know, being former dentists turned gunslingers. Uh, but, you know, there is some historical grounding in all of this because, in fact, many German Americans who were living in the United States during this time, especially those who lived in the North, uh, very much had an anti-slavery mindset. And a lot of them found themselves a political home within the newly emergent Republican Party that had built itself upon the notion of preventing slavery's growth into these westward territories like Texas that we see here. The moment where, where Django throws off his blanket and we see, you know, this kind of exp expression of empowerment uh, combined with the scars on his back, you know, it, it leads to this question that we must consider throughout the film, you know, is this a, a black empowerment film? Uh, is this a, a white guilt trip? Is it a, a white savior movie? Is it a black exploitation film? Is it merely a spaghetti western? Perhaps it's yes to all of the above. Let's talk about this. You got to be reasonable in a situation like this. This, this interaction uh, with, with the slaves and the, the pinned down slave seller speaks to a, a few different things. You know, to what extent are people complicit? You know, people said, hey, I'm just doing my job. Uh, and it speaks to the, the all-around consuming sinful nature of slavery. The other factor that we should take into consideration is that the greatest fear of most white people in mid-19th century America was a black man with a gun. And this is a fear that this movie revisits time and time again, thinking of it in historical hindsight. I'd like you to take two of these tonight, and then in the morning... Uh, the actor here on the, the front porch, <laughs> just said the expletive, uh, is actually a, a well-known actor from the 1950s and the 1960s by the name of Russ Tamblin, who was in 
a uh, number of westerns, musicals. He was in West Side Story. And uh, as is often the case with many Tarantino films, he gets a nice little cameo in this motion picture. I'm looking for the Brittle Brothers. However, at this endeavor, I'm, I'm at a slight disadvantage. And so far as I don't know what they look like. I know what they look like, all right. Here, less than 20 minutes into the film, we already get a sense of the character arc and evolution of Django. Because, you know, he starts out kind of timid. You know, he doesn't look people in the eye. He is very, you know, curt in his responses. He doesn't elaborate in, in any of his conversations uh, with people. And uh, here as he's teaming up with, with Dr. Schultz, uh, he's looking Dr. Schultz in the eye and uh, starts to take a more uh, proactive view uh, of life and the, the life that he may have from this moment onward, now that he has a gun and a horse. And to come into Bill Shop's town and show your ass. Here too, another acknowledgement from uh, earlier Westerns, uh, the, the Derringer pistol sliding out of uh, the, the sleeve uh, is something that we see in a lot of uh, you know, old Westerns, including uh, the, the steampunk TV show Western from the 1960s Wild Wild West. I want you to burn a runaway eye right here in his cheek. And the girl, too. This flashback reveals to audiences the sort of uh, sadistic horrors that slaves often had to endure. And certainly, Django Unchained takes many liberties with the historical record, but uh, something that, that you have to acknowledge that it gets right is, you know, the, these horrific conditions, um, these, these abysmal forms of punishment that were inflicted upon enslaved persons. Uh, and, you know, when we see this, this chain and gag and these rods sticking out of, you know, this, this thing around Django's neck, uh, this is, you know, very much, you know, rooted in reality. And you can see photographs of uh, slaves wearing contraptions much like this as a means of deterring them from uh, escaping or making them easy to apprehend uh, should they run out and seek their freedom. So uh, the film certainly does get some things right. Don't let me pick up my own clothes. Yeah, but of course. His name is Kang. He had a whole. Yeah, one thing that I find disappointing in regard to the material culture in this film, uh, if you look at Tarantino's other historical epics, including Inglorious Bastards and uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, the, the authenticity of the clothing is immaculate in those movies. And that same sort of accuracy is very much lacking in this movie. Um, the wardrobe is really that of a B-Western. And maybe that's exactly what Quentin Tarantino was going for. Um, because certainly spaghetti westerns are not known for their historical authenticity. Um, and so perhaps he's more so trying to reflect the taste of the 1960s rather than, let's say, the 1860s. Allow me to unring this bell. My name is Dr. King Schultz. This is my valet, Django. A lot of the clothing that we see in this movie, it's, it's really just completely ahistorical or it, it dates from decades after uh, the, the Civil War. Um, we could take, you know, Dr. Schultz's costume, for example. Um, the tie, the vest, the bowler cap. This looks like something more from the 1880s or the 1890s rather than the 1850s. Uh, so it's really off the mark by several decades. Well, come on inside and get yourself something cool to drink. <laughs> so uh, Big Daddy's plantation here is a, a real life plantation or a forced labor farm, if you want to call it that. Uh, called Evergreen Plantation. It's located in Louisiana, and it has served as the backdrop for a number of films. Uh, this one, Free State of Jones, Antebellum, uh, a whole host of films. You can look up, uh, you know, just how many times it's been used by, uh, by filmmakers. This place really evokes sort of what a plantation looks like in the American mindset. Big Steps, White columns, 
or neatly manicured grounds. And indeed, a lot of plantations, plantations did look that way. Um, more so, plantations were often smaller farms, weren't huge numbers of slaves on many of these plantations, but certainly big properties like this, perhaps closer to New Orleans, certainly did. Could you take Django there and take him around the grounds here and show him all the pretty stuff? As you please, be there. Oh, Mr. Bennett, I must remind you, Django is a free man. One of the things I really enjoy about Don Johnson's portrayal of Big Daddy uh, is that, you know, here too, Tarantino is trying to poke fun at everything Southern to an extent. Uh, because, of course, he looks like Colonel Sanders. This is not an accident. You know, he's in the white clothes, he has the white facial hair, he has the black bolo tie. Uh, and there are many sorts of archetypal characters in this film that, that we'll be seeing and analyzing throughout. The Lord said, the fear of ye and the dread of ye shall be on every beast of the earth. Uh, the brittle brother here uh, who is doing the, the whipping, um, it, it would seem, you know, going from his, his dialogue, uh, that he has pages of the Bible affixed to his apparel. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't at all a strange thing for, you know, overseers or slave owners to evoke the Bible as they were inflicting these sorts of miseries on enslaved persons. Uh, because, you know, what they would often do is, you know, they would quote the New Testament, you know, that slaves should be loyal to their earthly masters, so on and so forth. Uh, but they often neglected to inform their enslaved persons of passages from the Old Testament that included the book of Exodus and, you know, Moses' enslaved people seeking the promised land. Uh, and so uh, the Bible, much like the Constitution and many other important texts, can be interpreted to serve whatever purposes you want them to serve. And this was certainly the case with slavery in the years before the Civil War. I like the way you die, boy. God damn son of a bitch. Okay, so the brittle brother here who's fumbling over his sidearm, uh, you may not recognize him, but he has been in another movie that we have analyzed here on Real History. That is actor Cooper Huckabee, and he plays the spy Harrison in the movie Gettysburg. Check it out. You don't know if you're positive? I don't know what positive means means you're sure? Yes. Yes what? Yes, I'm sure that's Ellis Brittle. There's just some really iconic shots in this movie, and in my mind, you know, the spraying of the overseer's blood on the lily-white cotton is certainly one of them. Uh, because, you know, rightfully so, when we think of these big plantations in which cotton is being picked, you know, we think of the blood of enslaved people uh, you know, being speckled upon, you know, this cotton as such. Um, but here, the tables have turned, and it's a very uh, purposeful uh, moment here in the film as such. I am Dr. King Schultz, a legal representative of the criminal justice system of the United States of America. The man to my left is Django Freeman. He's my deputy. Now, one of the other ahistorical things that we, we see here as uh, Big Daddy's impromptu posse arrives on the scene after the killing of the Brittle Brothers, is that some of the enslaved people have weapons. Um, and this generally would not have happened, um, because as I said earlier, the greatest fear of plantation owners was their enslaved people being armed. Uh, and so uh, it's certainly, uh, you know, some exaggeration that we see here. May I please remove the warrant from my pocket so you may examine it? Give me. Something else notable, too, uh, is to point out some of the weaponry and uh, the rifle that Big Daddy has here uh, is a Henry repeating rifle, uh, which was uh, first used on a widespread basis uh, during the American Civil War. It could be a private purchase weapon. Uh, that uh, often soldiers in the Federal Army uh, could use. But uh, it would have been a very, very rare thing indeed to see a weapon like that in 1858, as is the case with a whole host of other weapons 
uh, here in this film, including, you know, uh, Colt 45s and uh, so on and so forth. And we wouldn't have seen sticks of dynamite either. Damn. I can't see fucking shit out of this thing. We ready or what? Oh, I really do enjoy the scene with the bags. Uh, because, you know, what this alludes to is the stupidity of the vigilante justice, justice, that we see here in the years before, and especially after the Civil War. Uh, you know, we see more vigilante violence like this, uh, you know, during Reconstruction and the, the earliest phases of the Ku Klux Klan. And, you know, undoubtedly, Quentin Tarantino is just trying to, you know, reveal what a bunch of, you know, just thoughtless thugs uh, these guys are. You know, that they're riding here out in the dark and they can't see what they're doing. Uh, and so there, it, it's, it's a bit of a, a nuanced message, perhaps, uh, more than, than anything else. Um, but he's definitely poking fun at this idea of, of white supremacy and the violence that was so stupidly and heinously used to uphold it during this era. As we see Django and, and Dr. Schultz uh, uh, emerge from the town here and go hit the road, go on their bounty hunting spree, uh, you know, uh, Tarantino did not view this as a white savior film at all. Uh, rather, he sees it as a buddy western. Uh, you know, undoubtedly, you know, he may have been even envisioning, you know, the likes of a more modern version like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Um, and he doesn't see Dr. Schultz, perhaps, in the realm of paternalism, um, but, you know, kind of an apprentice of sorts, you know, showing this guy the trade. Uh, and so, but you know, all these things are open to uh, interpretation because uh, you can dissect this movie a dozen different ways about its cultural commentary, its historical commentary. Uh, and so I leave it up to you, the audience, uh, to think about what exactly this movie means and what is its message. Ooh, what happened to me now? I want to shoot white folks for money. Another little bit of a historical problem here in regard to the weaponry, because the Sharps rifle that Django is using here uh, is an 1874 Buffalo, and so it's from almost two full decades later. Uh, but, you know, here in the late 1850s, uh, rifled weaponry was really coming, you know, to fruition. Uh, the idea of interchangeable parts, advanced weaponry, greater range, and of course these would be later be implemented and it would be found out the hard way just how uh, powerful they were on the battlefields of the Civil War. A lot of these scenes filmed out west, which I don't think look like Texas very much, uh, are, in my mind they're very reminiscent of films like Jeremiah Johnson, True Grit, you very much get the sense, uh, the artistic sense of the movies uh, from a, cine uh, a cinematography standpoint, uh, those which inspired uh, Quentin Tarantino. And so um, this is as much a reflection on the genre of the Western here in these scenes as it is any sort of reflection about uh, American slavery or antebellum America. This overhead shot where we see Mississippi in, in big white bold lettering scrawling across the screen, it's, it's very significant, artistically speaking, because if you watch the opening titles of Gone with the Wind from 1939, Tarantino is replicating that, those big iconic letters of Gone with the Wind. Uh, but there is quite a contrast here, as we can see. That opening shot of Gone with the Wind and all of its technicolor splendor, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful, bucolic shot of, of scenery and grandeur. And here, it is muddy. People are in chains. They are in shackles. They have these iron rods around their necks. Uh, and so, 
in essence, what Tarantino is doing here is that he is trying to dismantle sort of that lost cause romanticism of the Old South. He's poking fun at uh, the ludicrous idea that, you know, the old plantation was this beautiful bygone place, uh, you know, the likes of which we'll, we'll never see again. Um, and so, you know, it, this is so rich full of uh, cinematic references, if you look carefully enough. They're going to try to make a comfort, girl. What's a comfort? Oh, not while I got freedom, not while I got my gun. So as we were watching the, this scene here, uh, as uh, Django and Dr. Schultz are in this office, the students were wondering, why is it snowing outside? You know, they're, they're in Mississippi, you know, it, 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 does, it snows in Mississippi, but, you know, not a whole lot like we see here in the background. What that actually is, is cotton fibers uh, flowing through the air. Um, you know, speaking to this idea that cotton was everywhere, it was the lifeblood of the economy, and in this scene, you can't even breathe without it affecting you. So, uh, uh, interesting little artistic trait that we see here. Bonjour. Bonsoir, petite femme noire. We're here to see Mr. Calvin Candy. Entra. The idea of a place like the Cleopatra Club in New Orleans is not a far stretch at all because back in the mid-19th century, as is the case today, New Orleans was a very lively place. There was always partying. There were always people coming and going. And it was especially so for the elite landowners who owned this town, who owned the region, who ran every you know, point of affairs here in, in the Deep South. And, you know, the short of the matter was, is that these individuals made their money off the land, off of the sweat of other individuals, and oftentimes they would go to places like New Orleans to spend that, whether it was to buy additional human property or to have a good time at private gentlemen's clubs like we see here. New Orleans was one of the largest uh, slave trading centers on planet Earth in the 1850s, and a number of years earlier, when a young Abraham Lincoln happened to visit New Orleans, uh, the sight of being of people being in shackles on the docks and in the streets uh, was something that repelled him and was uh, burned in his memory, uh, further ingraining his anti-slavery sentiments, which would, of course, evolve likewise over the years. And he prefers Monsieur Candy to Mr. Candy. Si c'est cela qu'il préfère. He doesn't speak French. Don't speak French to him. It'll embarrass him. Uh, Calvin Candy's tendencies to, to, to want to embrace, uh, you know, aspects of, of French culture uh, whether it be his clothing or the desire to be called Monsieur Candy, uh, is, is fairly on the mark uh, for the temperaments of people in 1850s America because anything French was all the rage around the time period of the American Civil War. Um, and so for elite people of his standing, uh, it wouldn't be surprising at all if they would you know, demand of others to be called as such. Come on over. We got us a fight going on that's a good bit of fun. <laughs> this idea of this brutal gladiatorial type fighting here within the Cleopatra Club is one of the more controversial elements of this movie. Uh, you know, in the film it refers to this as Mandingo fighting. Uh, but there's really not a whole lot of hard evidence to suggest that you know, masters would pit their enslaved property against one another and fight to the death um, because that would have been rather counterintuitive and it would have been very poor business um, because after all, these owners, well, they owned people and it made no sense to be killing off your human property. Uh, what this is in this movie though is that you know, once more, Tarantino is giving a tip of the hat to black exploitation films of the 1960s and the 1970s, movies like Mandingo, uh, its sequel called Drum, uh, where, you know, slavery and race relations are depicted in these very brutal manners uh, as such. Um, and so here, once again, tells us as much about the 1960s and the 1970s as the pre-Civil War era. 
What's your name? Django. The, the actor standing here at the bar alongside uh, Jamie Foxx uh, is an Italian actor by the name of Franco Nero. And uh, here, too, is something that may have been over the heads of some audience members, uh, but Franco Nero played the original Django in the movie Django, which came out in the late 1960s. Uh, and so here in this scene, rather poetically, we have Django meeting Django. Uh, this scene with the, the dogs really underscores the nature of brutality inflicted upon slaves who would seek their freedom. Now, here too, often was the case that, you know, slaves were not killed for running away because, once again, that would be considered bad business. Uh, however, many forms of physical torture would often be inflicted upon those individuals who fled the plantation. Uh, you know, everything from uh, people being, you know, uh, burned on their faces, branded as if they were cattle, having fingers chopped off, uh, you know, for men, if they, you know, were, you know, involved in repeat offenses, so to speak, uh, worst case scenario, they could even be castrated. Uh, so horrible, horrible stuff uh, that was uh, done to uh, slaves who, you know, would, would dare to defy their masters and run away as such. Not necessarily were they being, you know, eaten up by dogs like we see here. Uh, but the, the consequences for freedom-seeking enslaved persons, it was incredibly brutal. I'm up to the left here. As we arrive here at the ironically named Candyland, there is so much to unpack and to analyze here. The first of which being the name of the plantation itself. You know, as we think of the board game Candyland, um, it's about as, as benign and lighthearted a thing as one could possibly think of. Um, and so, you know, here uh, Tarantino is playing on, you know, that myth that, you know, the plantation is a, a genteel, beautiful, uh, nostalgic desired place, and he turns that upside down on its head. Uh, the torture of Hildy here in the sweat box uh, is one element that, that undermines all of that. Hello, Stephen, my boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, my ass. Who this up on that name? The other big element for us to consider here as we enter Candyland, of course, is the character of Stephen as portrayed magnificently by Samuel L. Jackson. And what Samuel L. Jackson is doing in this role is that he is taking that myth of the, the loyal slave narrative uh, that we saw depicted in so, so many movies of earlier Hollywood history and even cultural products. Uh, you know, if we think of Uncle Remus from Walt Disney's Song of the South, if we think of these other sort of uh, archetypal characters like, you know, Uncle Ben, you know, from, uh, you know, rice products and, and things of that nature. Uh, this is the sort of character that he is mimicking. And, you know, there's, there's so many different ways that we can think about Stephen. Uh, you know, and at first, he seems like the dutiful, loyal slave Later on, we're going to find out it's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, but, you know, when thinking about real-life individuals that perhaps bore similarity to Stephen, you know, there is a well-documented hierarchy, you know, in which slaves in the big house, so to speak, uh, were treated better than field hands, uh, and there was an air of perhaps superiority um, when considering these sorts of dynamics. And, you know, perhaps Stephen is a, a product of that sort of environment. Um, and so, you know, perhaps it's, it's a play on some of these, you know, real life situations that play out. Oh, a tonic for tired eyes. Mm -hmm. 
May I present to you Low Lee, Candy Fitzwilly. Chester? Uh, something else that's speculative on my part uh, is this, uh, this very close, some would say incestuous sort of relationship or endearment that Calvin has with his sister here in these opening scenes and throughout subsequent scenes. And I have no doubt in my mind that this is an acknowledgement of, you know, the idea of, you know, uh, white supremacy, uh, bloodlines, you know, uh, keeping all the genetics within the family, uh, so to speak. Uh, and so uh, I have no doubt that this is perhaps a, a subtle acknowledgement of uh, those sorts of thoughts that Tarantino is coming up with here. Yeah, I believe you mentioned she spoke German. Ah, yes, Hildy, what about him? You know, something else for us to ponder uh, is the character of Broomhilda. Uh, and uh, she was actually uh, the, the subject, uh, her depiction that is, the subject of some discontent in an article about this film that I read in Smithsonian Magazine. Um, because, you know, when you think about it, um, there are a lot of empowered characters uh, in this movie. Uh, and they get into power contests and struggles with one another as the film plays out. Uh, but there's not really any empowered women uh, in the film. Um, but, you know, uh, enslaved women, you know, they sought agency, they sought freedom. I mean, let's think about Harriet Tubman for crying out loud. Um, and, you know, the question here is, when we think about Django Unchained, um, is this merely an old damsel in distress trope? Um, and so this was one of the, the great disappointments um, from one of the historians at the, the Smithsonian Museum of uh, African American History and Culture, and perhaps it's justified. In four years. Well, hell, I can't imagine two weeks in Boston. <laughs> Two weeks in Boston. I've been joking. It's important to pay attention to uh, Stephen's acts that he puts on here. You know, uh, laughing hysterically at the master's jokes, uh, hovering behind him to to serve his every whim. Uh, you know, to to offer his his own uh, flavor of of insight. Uh, but we're going to see a different side of Stephen uh, a little bit later on that uh, I think really uh, gets to the, the heart of the matter of who his character is in the film. About it. Hilly's got something like four lashes on her back. Lolly, just get one, she lose her goddamn mind. Look at that, Doctor. It's like a painting. Look at that. Calvin! As we think about the scars on Hilly's back, you know, uh, scars, if, if enslaved people were sold, you know, the, the scars and visible mutilations on their bodies was a, a barometer, a means of measuring if they were a good or bad slave. Um, that is to say, uh, were they, you know, supplicants, you know, to their masters? Uh, you know, did they adhere? Did they require punishment? Uh, and so, you know, horrifically enough, uh, Scores could tell more than one degree of story. You said you ain't know him. I don't. Yes, you do. This is one of the crucial scenes in the movie uh, because uh, we, it's finally revealed to the audience that up until this point, Stephen has been putting on a show. And we learn here in this scene that in essence, He's the smartest guy on the plantation. You'll notice three distinct dimples. Here, here, and here. These discussions of phrenology bring up a, a pertinent point uh, that, that is certainly connected with scientific understanding of the 1850s. Uh, phrenology was a, was a pseudoscience. Uh, predicated upon this belief that one's uh, physical features and dimensions, especially facial features and dimensions, could determine one's intellect, one's abilities, one's attitudes, etc., etc., 
uh, et cetera. And they had whole charts, you know, that, that supposedly, you know, mapped all of this out um, that would dictate one's personality. One of uh, several of the factors that led white slave owners um, to believe in this idea of their own racial supremacy uh, was a belief tied in with phrenology that, uh, you know, that the physical nature of African Americans were factors that led them to be subservient, childlike, animal-like, and therefore needed the guidance of a superior white race. This was the belief of people at the time, people like Calvin Candy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, these conversations, these thoughts, they were very real. Uh, they were a brick in the foundation of eugenics, which would gain, you know, horrifying momentum uh, later on in, in the 20th century. And it was a, certainly a realm of scientific thought that had a lot of long-term damage and implications. Hey! Now lay your palm flat on that tabletop! If you lift those palms off that turtle shell tabletop... And uh, one of the, the oft-repeated stories uh, about this uh, film that circles on the internet uh, is that Leonardo DiCaprio became, you know, so, so energetically involved in these very heated scenes, you know, when he slams his hand down on the table, uh, he, he actually cuts his hand open, and that is his actual blood uh, on, on his hand here, um, that it is not prop blood or makeup blood. Or, uh, or anything like that. And so uh, here is a method actor who is certainly in the moment, and it shows. If y'all want to leave Candyland with Broomhilda, the price is $12,000. Just in case you're wondering, $12,000 in 1858 is pushing $400,000 today. And so that is a substantial chunk of change. When we see these flashbacks of, you know, Dr. Schultz thinking uh, about this, this slave who was torn away by dogs, you know, it, these sorts of reactions were not uncommon um, among uh, foreigners who came to the United States when slavery was thriving. You know, we can think about the Marquis de Lafayette. We can think about Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, these Frenchmen who come to this country and they think that America has such great potential uh, to become such a, an astounding and unique nation, one that, that talks about and embraces personal liberty in so, so many ways, yet is built upon the idea of human chattel and so many others. Uh, and so uh, these sorts of contradictions were very much on the minds of foreign individuals who came to the United States, perhaps people of the same temperament as Dr. Schmoltz. Couldn't resist. And then, of course, what we see in the ensuing scenes is just uh, pure mayhem and just this uh, cacophony of, of gore and, uh, you know, of violence that is, you know, just uh, hyper, you know, beyond uh, any stretch of the imagination. But it's, uh, it's interesting to point out here uh, at this <laughs> crucial and violent moment of the film um, the sort of uh, weapon that Django is using, and that is an 1858 model Remington, uh, one that was used uh, quite frequently by United States troops uh, during the American Civil War and onward. Uh, and so in, this, in the time that this movie is set, that was a brand new weapon that was cutting edge technology. And he certainly puts it to good use in these scenes here. You know, as these scenes play out, we have the modern music playing in the background. You know, it, it led to another really interesting question for the classroom, you know, as students were watching this, you know, when is it okay to laugh at violence, uh, as is depicted in, in movies? Um, you know, we can ask the same sort of, you know, philosophical question when we think about, you know, the other Tarantino film, Inglorious Bastards. Um, and, you know, and perhaps, you know, I, I think the question in the minds or the answer in the minds of many viewers 
Um, well, you know, when, when bad people, when evil people get their comeuppance, whether it be Nazis or slave owners, maybe then it's okay to laugh. You know, the students were, you know, they were somewhat ambiguous um, on this point. Uh, but, you know, it, it's certainly a lively and colorful moment in the movie that uh, begs our consideration. Personally, I don't give a good goddamn what you believe or don't believe. I believe if you don't give up in the next 10 seconds, we gonna blow this bitch's brains out. As we think of Steven's character as being this sort of uh, comical take on a racial stereotype of the, the loyal slave, you know, when we take, you know, kind of the, these harder, grimmer considerations into mind, you know, he, he further reveals, you know, who he is here in these scenes. And it speaks to the sometimes uh, hidden power struggles that occurred within slave communities on real life plantations where uh, some slaves simply had to endear themselves to their masters in order to avoid the wrath of their masters, uh, you know, in order to survive this dreadful system they themselves had to sometimes embrace the horrors of that system. And, you know, perhaps in this regard, um, we could consider Stephen as much a, a victim of his own circumstances as he is a villain of the circumstances. Um, we don't get that sort of that nuanced interpretation of him uh, here in, in the film, but, you know, things like that were certainly within the realm of possibility. They walked us from the Greenville auction and he rode in on a horse with a white man. And this white man was a black his slave. These scenes here with uh, the LaQuint Dickey uh, Mining Company employees, uh, I think are perhaps among the worst when it comes to material culture. Um, in the film, we see a guy wearing a Confederate kepi, even though the Confederacy doesn't exist yet. Uh, a historical uh, straw hat. Uh, the, the leather vest, uh, you know, it, nothing in this clothing is, is anywhere right whatsoever. And the other weird thing, too, is that, you know, a few moments ago we were in the, the lush, humid countryside of Louisiana, and now we somehow find ourselves in the hills of California um, that are very arid and dry and tan-looking. Uh, and so not only is the clothing and so many other things off, but the landscape itself is off quite considerably as well. All right. I've just had the sights fixed, and they're perfect. Oh, that's good to know. And naturally, one cannot overlook the comedic irony uh, that Quentin Tarantino has himself killed in this movie. Now if he made you cry, oh, I gotta know. And uh, all, all, the, all the dirt, all the dust that uh, he, he, Django cleans from his face, it's like he's taking off a mask. He was playing this character in the name of survival for the benefit of these white folks around him. And after he does away with them, he, you know, washes away his face and his blackness is revealed. Uh, great little artistic subtleties that we see here. Uh, one student asked me what that, what that gadget was with uh, the photos, and uh, that is what is called a stereo viewer. And uh, there was a thing as uh, stereographic photography, and it was a camera that would take an image, uh, well, two near identical images, you put them side by side, have them mass produced on viewing cards, you slide them into the viewer of the stereo view, and it creates this optical illusion of a, kind of a, a three-dimensional look. Now, I've taken these uh, into the classroom before, and it absolutely mesmerizes students. Um, and things like that were really important in the 19th century when people's worlds were really small. They couldn't see these sorts of places on TV or in movies, and they most likely would never be able to travel to them. And so things like stereo viewers were able to bring this outside world literally into focus. D do what now? I said, tell Miss Laura goodbye. Bye, Miss Laura. <laughs> okay, 
It is kind of funny. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, for now, I didn't know the burgundy was my color. As uh, Stephen throws away his cane, you know, he kind of further reveals himself that, uh, you know, he was likewise putting on this act. And, you know, in some regards, you know, Django and Stephen have a little bit more in common that perhaps they're willing to admit. Both of these guys have to put on, you know, these, these shows uh, in order to maintain their survival and get ahead in life. That would have been a really interesting dynamic, I think. You know, as this power struggle emerges between uh, these two characters, if the filmmaker had reflected on their similarities as much as their differences. He's the guy who's the talk of the town with the restless guy. It's a highly symbolic moment here when Django blows up Candyland. And in doing so, he cinematically destroys the myth, the lost cause myth, of the happy plantation. He takes that idea of a place like Terra, the fictional plantation in Gone with the Wind that is transfixed in the American mind, often when we think of the American South, and he turns that notion upside down on its head he reinforces with an exclamation point that this is not a, a happy um, or, you know, gleeful place at all. It is a, a place of suffering. It is a prison without walls. And ultimately, he destroys it uh, in the end, uh, alluding to the fact that we should never have been beguiled by this setting in the first place as American society. Uh, and so this is uh, really, you know, at, at the heart of the movie. Uh, when we think about what unfolds here in the climax as Django and his wife uh, ride away from the burning rubble. So for uh, this episode, I actually have three recommended readings that tie in with some of the subject matter as featured in Django Unchained. And uh, one of which I mentioned, and that is the book South to Freedom. Uh, which uh, really reflects on some of the themes of the, the first chapter of the movie, especially in regard to Texas, uh, how it was kind of this, this borderland between uh, freedom and slavery. And this is a, a very thought-provoking book um, along those lines as we consider the long-term buildup to the American Civil War. Uh, another book uh, for us to think about, when we think about uh, slave uprisings, and uh, enslaved people trying to uh, overthrow their masters. Um, of course, the most famous incident in this regard uh, was uh, John Brown's 1859 anti-slavery raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia, where I used to be a park ranger and really enjoyed working at. Um, that book by Tony Horowitz uh, is called Midnight Rising. And there's a lot of good prologue in this book uh, that talks about some of these uh, various uprisings, especially those that took place in Virginia uh, prior to the American Civil War. And so um, there's a little bit of Django uh, in some of the, the characters, the real-life characters, as highlighted in this wo uh, work. Um, and then, uh, finally, um, we have the book The Second, Race and Guns in a Fatally Unequal America by Carol Anderson. Um, and one of the, the key premises of this book uh, is that, you know, access to guns or inaccess to guns is a major historical component that has long been overlooked in the historical record. And, you know, as we mentioned before in this film, one of the great fears of white landowners in the South was African Americans' access to guns. Uh, and, uh, you know, the author contends that this is, you know, kind of a, a long-going uh, historical feud. Um, and, you know, when, uh, when white individuals were, you know, uh, expressing their cause or taking up arms in the name of a cause, um, often freedom was invoked with that, uh, but that was often how it was not viewed in regard to African Americans who took up weapons in the name of liberating themselves. 
Uh, and so that sort of disparity and fear and paranoia that we see in certain aspects of Django Unchained are chronicled very much so in the book The Second. And so I encourage you to check out any of these three books. And of course, the, the scholarship on American slavery is vast. And if you head to Amazon, you'll find no shortage of books on that topic. Django Unchained, of course, is a uh, very different historical film. Um, in some ways, it is thoroughly grounded in historical reality, and in other ways, it is pure historical fantasy. Uh, but as I suggest with all of the films that we take a look at here on real history, uh, in this film in particular, I think we need to think of it as a primary source of the 2010s, much, much more so than a historical interpretation of the 1850s. Um, in a way, it is a, a cinematic prologue to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the renewed civil rights movement, uh, reconsiderations of race uh, in 21st century America. And suffice it to say that Django Unchained is a movie that historians and film scholars and film buffs will be talking about for a long, long time to come. So, with all that being said, we once again thank you for tuning in to Real History. We look forward to seeing you next time.